Thanks for joining us today on Thursday, March 21st for our webinar entitled The Biggest Wage in Hour and Payroll Mistakes. This is Denise Ketty, and I'm your moderator for this session. A couple of housekeeping notes before I introduce today's expert panel. The webinar is going to run approximately 60 minutes in total. Please take a moment now to visit the handout area on your dashboard to download a copy of today's presentation. If you have questions during our presentation, please post them in the Q&A area on the dashboard at any time during the presentation. And if you would like your question directed to a specific panelist, you can note that when you're sending in your questions. If you have any issues during the presentation, you can email me directly at denisemketty at gmail.com. Just a quick reminder that today's webinar is being recorded and all the accompanying materials are protected by copyright. Our presentation today provides general information and does not constitute legal advice. And the information offered during the webinar is as of today, March 21st, 2019. As always, we recommend that you consult your own legal counsel to address your specific situation to ensure you have the most current information on legal matters. Let me introduce you to our expert panel today. Today's expert, uh, today's uh, legal expert was supposed to be Marla Murhab Robinson, but today Marla just welcomed a brand new, her first got, uh, grandchild this morning named Taylor Elizabeth. So she will not be joining us this morning for very good reasons as she is taking care of her grandmother role. But today, pitching for her, we have our legal expert, Curtis Uriah, who is an associate at Murhab Robinson Jackson and Clarkson in the firm's transactional department, where he advises clients in retail, uh, sorry, real estate, finance, business succession planning, corporate and employment law. Curtis has contributed articles to law journals and is a part-time lecturer and teaches classes on economics and conscious capitalism and business law. And he also has been a part of our webinar series in the past. So we uh, appreciate you pitching in today at the last minute, Curtis. Our human capital expert today is Linda Duffy, president of Ethos Human Capital Solutions. Linda and her team is known for building the magic of the human connection with their consulting, recruiting, training, and also payroll support programs. The Ethos team works with your company by developing strategies for business leaders to get the right systems, people, and culture in place within your organization so that you as a business owner can focus on running your business and achieving your goals. Her clients range from high-tech businesses to manufacturing firms to nonprofit organizations, and Linda is well-versed in addressing the concerns of founder CEO-led businesses. Curtis, can you kick us off and start our webinar this morning? Yes, happy to. Thank you for the, the introduction there. Uh, and I'm happy to be here, happy to, to uh, step in for Marla while she's welcoming the, her brand new grandbaby. And so today we're going to be talking about the biggest wage and hour and payroll mistakes that, that we see from a law firm perspective and from an, an HR perspective. These are problems or these are questions that we get from clients on a, a regular basis and typically are the, the questions that we questions of the problems that we see most frequently. And so to just give you a brief introduction of what we're going to discuss today, biggest problems and mistakes that we see have to do with misclassifying employees ex as exempt, misclassifying employees as independent contractors, questions and problems regarding travel time and reimbursement for using personal vehicles, reporting time pay, standby call and pay, and a new case that just recently came out that affects uh, that subject, paid sick leave, even though it's four years into it, we still see lots of problems and I get lots of questions. We still get a lot of questions about meal periods. And most importantly here, the regular rate calculations when it comes to overtime. We see a lot of problems with the regular rate calculations. So let's go ahead and jump into our first topic here, misclassifying employees as exempt. And we've done several webinars on this topic. But, and we, we, we talk to our clients a lot and we, the subject comes up pretty frequently, but we notice that this is still a problem, that employers have a lot of questions about how to properly classify an employee as exempt and often are faced with problems of misclassifying an employee as exempt. The biggest takeaway that I want everyone to, to have is that 
merely paying an employee a salary does not make that employee exempt. So just because you pay an employee $50,000 a year does not mean that that employee is exempt. There are two requirements to properly classify an employee as exempt. One, pay the minimum salary, of course. But two, the employee must pass a duties test. What does that mean? Well, there's, there's three main types of duties tests that the employees must pass. And these, these duties tests are established by federal laws and federal regulations. And California has adopted these tests as well with a few minor variations. Quick note, if you want to go back and look at some of the past webinars that we've done on exempt analysis, exempt employees, you just go to our YouTube page and you can see some of our, our, our past videos and get a more deep, a more in-depth uh, discussion of classifying employees as exempt or non-exempt. So next, uh, talk about that salary threshold. Currently in California, the if you if you're an employer with 26 or, or sorry 25 or fewer employees, the minimum salary is 45,760. This is based on uh, twice the minimum wage for full-time work. So right now the minimum wage for small employee employers is $11 an hour. Times that by two. Times that by 1,000. Or, sorry, multiply that by 2,080 and you get 45,760. And if you have an employer with 26 or more employees, the current minimum salary is 49,920. And that will go up each year when the minimum wage goes up. So in a couple of years, when we hit that $15 per hour as a minimum wage, the minimum salary is also going to go up somewhere around the $60,000 range. This is the, the, the minimum selling threshold is, is mainly for or is primarily for the professional, the administrative and the managerial exemptions. And there's a, additional or separate seller requirements for the other versions of the exemption. So computer software professionals, the current minimum salary is $94,603. And for licensed physicians, the physicians must be paid at least $82.72 per hour. If you have inside sales employees, these are employees who spend more than half of their time, working time, at your business location, at your facility, at your office, performing sales. And these are employees who receive commissions on their sales. There is an inside sales exemption that's different than the professional or, or administrative or managerial ex exemptions, where an inside sales employee can be exempt from receiving overtime. For that to happen, for that inside sales employee to be exempt, the inside sales employee must earn one and a half times the minimum wage, and 50% or more of all commission, or 50% or more of the employee's income must come from commission. Just a note there, the inside sales exemption just exempts overtime. It's inside sales employees must still receive breaks, rest periods, et cetera, et cetera. So the duties test, we've talked about it here a little bit. The executive, executive or managerial, as I've mentioned to it here. The executive, these are employees who manage two or more employees or supervise two or more employees. And have supervisorial duties that include hiring and firing decisions that include training the, the subordinate employees, that include supervising, that include even performance reviews and examinations, et cetera. Administrative employees, this is probably the most difficult exemption to, to 
to classify an employee under just because it's it's when people hear the administrative exemption they think oh well this person is an office administrator well there's more elements to it than just somebody who administers the operations of the business the employees must also have independent discretion and judgment and there's a lot of rules and a lot of details that go in into what that means and then learned professionals these are going to be your, your, your licensed professionals, such as attorneys, doctors, CPAs, engineers, psychiatrists, etc. If you're in a profession where you are licensed by the state, then you can be exempt under the learning professional. There's also a possibility under the, the, the professional exemption where employees who work in a learned or artistic position can be exempt. But there's additional requirements that must be met for that to for that to happen. And then the computer employee exemption. This does not apply to just your your average IT professional, your average uh, IT tech who's going to be information technology tech who's going to be helping set up your system or running diagnostics or or, or, or fixing problems on your network or setting up computers, installing or uninstalling software. Computer professionals, these are employees who are actually writing software, who are actually doing testing of software. So there are like, a lot of times I get questions, well, this person does XYZ duties, I want to make them a computer professional. Well, it's not just somebody who works with computers, it's somebody who works at a, a high level, such as actually writing software. And then outside sales is probably the easiest exemption to meet. This is an employee that spends more than half of their time outside of the office or at home office uh, making sales, or, or more than half of their time outside of the office making sales. That's it. That's all you have to do to meet the outside sales exemption. There's no minimum salary requirement. The idea here is if the employee's working and spending their time making sales, then they're earning commissions. So this comes up a lot and is a problem when employers misclassify their employees as exempt. When employers misclassify their, employ their employees as exempt, the employer exposes themselves to various forms of liability. We've got a log list here of the different items that employers can be liable for. The most common problem that we, we are faced when an employee is misclassified as exempt is unpaid wages and unpaid overtime. And the penalties that can rack up when you're not, when you don't pay an, pay an employee all wages due, when you don't pay the appropriate overtime premiums can be substantial. So there's the actual wages that are missed, there's penalties under the code, but then where it really becomes a problem is attorney fees. The California Labor Code states that when an employee sues for these types of wage and hour claims, that the employee is entitled to recover their attorney fees. So I've seen claims where the employee's wages were in the ten to twenty thousand dollar range, but the attorney fees, after going to trial and losing, are in the three hundred thousand dollar range. I've seen it. So even though the, the missed wages may not seem like a lot. It's important to remember that employees are entitled to their attorney's fees in connection to these wage and hour claims. And that's what could really kill a claim. That's what could really harm the employer. All right, so next up on our topic here, we've got misclassified employees as independent contractors. And the, the, the liabilities, as you see when we get to that, are going to be pretty similar to those for misclassifying employees as exempt. So last year we got the Dynamics case, or Dynamics case, however it's pronounced, where the California Supreme Court decided to issue a new rule, which apparently courts can do that, issue a new rule, create a new law on how to what the law is for classifying employees as, as classified workers as independent contractors in California. 
and the California Supreme Court adopted the ABC test. So what this means is for, an, for a worker to be properly classified as an independent contractor, the, the worker must meet all three elements of this test, meaning the worker must be free from the control and direction of the hiring entity. The worker must perform work that is outside the usual course of the hiring entity's business. And that worker must be customarily engaged or has independently established a trade occupation or business. There's still, there's, we're, we're getting a lot of, uh, we're seeing a lot of problems on this because before this case came out, we used, the, the law was based on a 14 or 15 factor test where we could make great arguments as to why an employee should be, or why a worker should be classified as an independent contractor. But now this test makes it a whole lot difficult to classify a worker as an independent contractor. If, let's say that uh, you've got a software development company and you have, you have a position where you have an employer or you have an employee who is a, a tester, but that tester quits and now you need to replace that person. And so you decide to bring in an independent contractor, 1099 employees, just kind of test them out for the first, I don't know, three, six months to see how they do. But if the company is in the business of making and testing and developing software and that person is coming in to do what that business does, that person cannot be classified as an independent contractor. And so I get a lot of questions, well, what can we do to get around this? And there isn't much. It could be the possibility where the worker has independently established their own LLC or corporation and the company hires that LLC or corporation instead of hiring the individual worker. That might work. There was some language in the footnotes of the Dynamics case that indicates that might work, but we don't know if that's, we can't guarantee that that safety. We don't know if that's a safe harbor. But the takeaway here is we are now dealing with the ABC test and it's now much more difficult to classify independent workers as independent contractors. So again, the liability for misclassifying an employee is very similar to the liability for misclassifying an exempt employee. Minimum wage, overtime, paying all wages, risk breaks, penalties that get uh, assigned by the code. Again, attorney's fees is gonna be your biggest problem. There's an additional layer here for misclassifying worker is I-9 compliance. Now, instead of just having to pay wages that are missed, the, the federal government through the USCIS can come in and shut you down. And as another layer, make it just a little more complicated, the California EDD and the IRS can come in and audit you because you're not paying payroll taxes for your, your misclassified workers. And there could be workers' comp uh, ramifications. Your carrier might want to charge you more money for misclassifying your workers. You could face penalties for not paying into the unemployment insurance fund. So takeaway here is it's much more difficult to classify workers as independent contractors and the penalties for doing so can be severe. I have seen businesses get shut down or misclassifying their workers as independent contractors due to the, the burden of penalties and fees that accumulated from doing so. All right, moving on to our next topic here. This is one that, that this is a question that we get a lot. Travel pay is not, is not a, a, a simple Topic. It's not a simple uh, topic to discuss. So the general rule is that the DLSE relies on, that the courts will rely on, is that employees must be paid whenever employees are performing work. And what, so what does that mean? Employees are performing work whenever they are at the direction and control of the employer. So 
How does that apply to travel pay? If an employer is directing or controlling an employee with regards to travel, then the employee needs to be paid. So first we're going to talk about non-exempt employees. Employees are paid hourly. The one kind of relief, the one good thing that we have is the law does recognize that all employees travel to work. And we, we sometimes call this just the normal or average commute. So just driving to work, even though you're being required to show up to work, you're being directed to show up to work, driving to work or taking the train or bike or walking or an Uber, whatever you've got, is, does not have to be compensated. It's unpaid. The normal commute is unpaid. But once you arrive to work and once you're, you're under the direction and control of your, your employer, all hours must be paid. It's all hours work. So, for example, let's say we've got a construction company. The, the team of laborers shows up to the employer's office and gets some trucks and then drives to the job site. Well, as soon as those employees get in those trucks, trucks and are under the direction and control of the employer, then those employees must start being paid. The clock starts. And that travel time to the job site is time paid. It's time worked. It must be paid. Now, what if, same scenario, employees, the laborers for a construction company, don't go directly to the office, but instead they go directly to the job site. Well, again, the law recognizes a normal commute. So that normal commute does not have to be paid. However, though, travel involving a substantial distance will have to be paid. And so what does that mean? Again, there's, there's no good definition in the labor code. It's just whatever is reasonable. So if employees are required to travel a substantial distance or are required to travel an unreasonable distance longer than a normal commute, then that time spent beyond the normal commute time must be paid. So let's talk real quick about traveling out of town. So you've got a conference or a trade show you're going to travel to. All travel time ta counts as time work. When you're traveling out of town, all travel time counts as time worked. So driving, driving, if you're going to drive it up across the state, that whole time counts. If you're flying, the whole time spent flying counts. You can deduct your, your normal commute time of, of driving to, say, the plane or the, the air, airport or to the train station. And you can deduct time that the employee should take for a lunch period, lunch, a meal period. But generally, all time spent traveling or out of town travel is time worked. And when you're traveling out of town, there's often going to be overnight out of town travel. Non exempt employees who are required to travel away must be paid for the travel time. However, sleeping in a hotel or other accommodation does not have to be paid because when you're sleeping, you're not at the direction of control of your employer. But all travel time and all time spent attending the conference or seminar or trade show must be paid. All right, a couple more points to make on travel time. Exempt employees. So everything I've said so far here applies just to non-exempt employees. Exempt employees doesn't matter. Exempt employees are paid for performing the work. They're not paid by the hour. So when it comes to travel time and exempt employees, travel time is kind of already paid as part of that salary, so there's really nothing to discuss. Other situations when travel time is not paid, if the employee chooses on the employee's own to attend a seminar or conference or training or class and is not required or directed or recommended by the employer to attend that class, then the employee is not at the direction of control of the employer and the employee does not have to be paid for that time. 
as we mentioned here, uh, unpaid time for meal periods does not have to be does not have to be paid, and personal time. Say an employee that goes on a, a, a trip, goes to a trade show, and takes some personal time to do some sightseeing or shopping or whatever. That is not time spent at the direction of control of the employer, so it does not have to be paid. And one more point to make here when it, when it comes to travel time is when an employee is using their personal vehicle for work, all mileage incurred using a personal vehicle for work must be reimbursed under California law. There's a couple different methods that are that the California courts have accepted, but the easiest one is just reimbursed at the, the, the IRS mileage rate. And when it comes to paying travel time, I get this question a lot. Travel time does not have to be paid at the employee's skilled rate. So what do I mean by that? Travel time is time work. And as long as you're paying the employee no less than the minimum wage, then you're not violating the law. So employers actually have the possibility of paying employees minimum wage or other wage, as long as it's not lower than minimum wage. You pay minimum wage for travel time. So I gave the scenario where laborers of a construction company show up at the office, jump into trucks, and then drive to a construction site. The ordinary commute to the office not paid. And then time when you jump into the trucks and drive to the construction site is paid as travel time. But, however, that travel time does not have to be at the, the employee's skilled labor rate. That travel time can be at the minimum wage. And when the employee gets to the job site and starts performing skilled duties, then the employees, then the employer can start paying the employee a skilled rate. So what you what you see is employees can be paid two different rates as long as the rate never drops below minimum wage. There's an HR element here too, and an employee morale issue as well because employees don't want to be paid minimum wage, but paying travel time is expensive, and it's something that the, the company has to balance with the uh, employee morale. If the company is going to pay travel time at a rate less than the employee's straight rate or base rate, the employee must be notified in advance. All right, so that's all we want to say about travel time. And we move on now to reporting time pay. So there's a, a new law that came out a couple of weeks ago regarding reporting time pay, call-in pay. This is the, the, the Ward versus Tilly's case. So in Ward versus Tilly's, Tilly's is a, a, a retail apparel footwear store often in the mall. And it, sales employees and, and cashiers would often be scheduled on call shifts where the employee would call in two hours before a shift to find out if the employee should show up to work. And if an employee called in two hours before and said, hey, call and see if I've got any work, and Tilly says, no, we don't need you, don't come in, Tilly's would not pay that employee any kind of money, presumably because Tilly's believed that the employee didn't perform any work, didn't show up to work. So class action was filed. Employees sued Tilly's, claiming that they should be paid for that time. And sure enough, the court agreed that calling in by any means or any means communicating or contacting the employer to find out if the employee should report for a, a on-call shift or for a scheduled on-call shift is really reporting to work even though the employee doesn't physically show up to work so if the employee reports to work and there's no work to do the employee must be paid at least half of the shift half of their scheduled or average working time up to a maximum of four hours. Reporting time PA before this didn't really come up very often. 
there may have been rare instances where an employee would show up to work and the company would just be, would just say, sorry, we don't have any work for you to do today, but we'll, we'll send you home. We'll pay you half your shift. It doesn't happen very often, but now with this new law, just calling in to find out if the employee should show up to work for a on-call or a standby shift incurs reporting time pay. So this is a, a new case that we're, we're dealing with and we're, we're, we're coming up with policies and procedures to see if we can get around from having to, to make these reporting time pay penalties. All right, real quickly, standby call and pay. The, when you have an employee that's on standby or on call, the standby or on call time must be paid unless the employee is uncontrolled. What does that mean? Employees have physical freedom to go around, travel, do whatever they want, spend time with their friends, family, shopping, just have to have their phone on them. Controlled, that's, these are people who have to be, who are confined to a physical area or confined to a specific time. There's more details, more rules on how that applies, but the basic idea is for standby or call, or call and pay, it's controlled versus uncontrolled. So those are the, the topics that I wanted to cover. I'm going to hand it over to Linda now, and Linda's going to continue with some more topics. Curtis, thank you so much. That was really insightful, and as always, I learned stuff from you, so that was good. Hi, I'm going to start out with paid sick leave. As Curtis mentioned earlier, uh, this is still something that's been in effect, you know, coming up on four, on four years now, five years, four years now, I guess, um, and we still see companies make mistakes when we go out to audit them. Just yesterday, um, Ivana and I, our director of consulting services, were working with a client that's buying a company, and we get the handbook for the company that's being purchased, and we look, and we think, oh my gosh, you know, you have to be really careful here. You're buying a potential claim because the handbook does not provide for enough sick time. They did what's very typical, which is they combined it with vacation. They call it PTO, but during the first year, they don't even start accruing PTO until after 90 days. And then for the rest of that time, they accrue five days. It doesn't meet the standard. So the rule, just to remind everybody, is that you must have 24 hours or three days worth of sick pay, so meaning three days could be higher if you're on like 10 hour work days or a 980 work schedule, something like that. You have to have that available by day 120 if you're on your own system of accrual, or you have to use the state's method of, of accruing, which is one hour of sick for every 30 hours of work, or you have to front load sick pay. And I put an exclamation point there because Marla and Curtis and I are all in agreement, just front load the sick pay and be done with it. The only time that we um, even consider going with an accrual is if you have part-time employees or just people that work sort of every once in a while, something like that, then they may not work enough time to ever hit that 24 hours. But for the most part, the easiest way to just manage this whole thing is just to front load the time. You also want to remember, I put a little asterisk there, to check local ordinances. This client we're working with right now as an example is acquiring a company that has four retail locations down in San Diego County. Well, one of them is in San, the city of San Diego, so they actually have a requirement to provide 40 hours. So that's similar to the city of Los Angeles and some unincorporated areas. San Francisco has different rules. There are quite a number of cities now that have different sick pay rules. So you always want to make sure you're, comp you're complying with whatever that higher standard is. Um, the other thing I should mention on that before I move on is uh, the other rule about sick pay that comes up every once in a while as a violation is you have a requirement to provide employees with their paid sick leave balance on every pay period. Now, normally most professional payroll services, it shows up whether it's in the form, again, of sick pay or PTO, but it'll show the balance on the time or the wage statement. If for some reason you're doing payroll 
personally, which I would not recommend, but if you're doing it in-house, um, you're just writing checks to people, whatever the case is, you want to make sure you're also uh, providing them with some sort of wage statement or some kind of just report that shows what their paid sick leave balance is. The, the penalties for messing this up are, again, long and painful. So in this case, uh, under Labor Code Section uh, 248.5, subsection E, the Labor Commission or the Attorney General can bring a civil action for penalties at $50 per employee per day that you're not compliant with this, and that can go up to an aggregate of $4,000 per employee in liquidated damages. So you don't want to do that. Um, the language we does not necessarily provide a right uh, for a PAGA claim or a Private Attorney General Act claim, but defense counsel and plaintiff counsel bars are sort of split on whether or not a PAGA claim can be brought. If a PAGA claim is brought, then the initial violation is $100 penalty per employee per pay period for the initial violation, and then it goes up to $100. Um, so you want to make sure, again, you're taking a look at all of your different policies and procedures and make sure that you're compliant uh, on this issue. Meal periods is another one that still comes up a lot. It's been several years since Brinker, uh, but we always see different issues and we get a lot of questions during the week for having to do with meal periods. So we know that under uh, Labor Code Section uh, 512 that employees must be provided uh, with a meal period if they are going to work more than five hours in a day. That meal period, according to the Brinker decision, must be taken before the end of their fifth hour. Okay, so That's what I mean by the fifth hour rule. So you're going to give them a meal period. They have to start it by the end of their fifth hour. They cannot combine it with their breaks. They cannot, because they want to go see their kid play you know, baseball in the afternoon, take it at 4 o'clock and leave early. They can't do any of those things. What they have to do is start it by the end of their fifth hour. So if somebody's working a regular schedule of 8 to 5 and taking an hour lunch, as an example, they would need to start their lunch by 12.59. But here's the catch and here's something to remember. What if that employee clocked in at 7.55? Now the end of their fifth hour is is 12.55. They need to start it at 12.54, okay? So we get in this habit of, oh, I'm just going to go to lunch at 1 o'clock every day. But if the employee clocks in early, they have to also start their lunch early. So that's something that's really important to remember. Um, there is a second meal period requirement if anybody is working over 10 hours in a day. Um, so you want to make sure you're providing them with a second uh, meal period. Now, there are meal period waivers, and again, we see a mistake made a lot where, where to some employers that means, oh, if the employee doesn't want to take their lunch, they can just waive it. That's not the case. You can waive a lunch only under two circumstances. You can waive your lunch if you are going to work between five but no more than six hours. That means they don't go to six hour in one minute because now you're in violation, but if an employee is not going to work more than six hours in a day, they can waive with your agreement, a mutual decision, they can waive their meal period. So they just work their six hours, take a 10 minute break, okay? Um, the other way can be waived if somebody's working more than 10 hours and not more than 12 hours in a day and they don't wanna take their second meal period, but they've already taken their first meal period, they can waive that second meal period, okay? Other than that, waivers are pretty much worthless, okay? So don't hang your hat on, um, my employee didn't want to take a lunch, they wanted to leave at 4 o'clock today, so I'm just going to have them sign a waiver. It's not going to hold up. I just I just sat through a lunch at the Orange County Employment uh, and Labor Bar Association a couple weeks ago, and they had plaintiff's counsel, defense counsel, and in-house counsel on a panel, and the plaintiff's counsel was practically drooling, you know, on this type of complaint, because he says he sees it all the time. People just go, oh, I don't want to take a lunch, I'll just sign something and eat at my desk, and he says, I can get around that all day long and uh, get penalties for that. The other thing to keep in mind, it's really important how you enforce the meals. So the first and foremost, I always tell people it's management, right? It's up to managers to enforce it. Now, they don't have to police people, but here's what I mean by the enforcement. We have a call from a client that's a manufacturer. Um, the controller calls and says, I don't know what to do. We have an employee and he just will not comply. 
And so she's trying, she's trying to figure out how to how to force the employee to comply. And I said, well, where's your production manager, right? Why is your production manager not walking around? And if and if he's noticing that people are not leaving when they're supposed to be, it's okay to say, hey, you need to go. But if they're if you know that they're going to work through their lunch or you know that they're being late, you are going to end up paying penalties for that. You also want to make sure that you don't just auto deduct 30 minutes because People are going to claim after the fact, oh, but I got interrupted, or I really didn't get my full 30 minutes, or something like that, and you're going to end up with penalties for that. Now, the other way, if you want to, quote unquote, enforce meal periods, um, if you work like an environment like a manufacturing where you can have bells where everything gets shut down and everybody leaves together, that's obviously a lot easier to enforce. So even though Brinker said we don't have to police that, we just have to provide it, we see clients all the time get in trouble. Uh, on this issue because employees are going to claim that they didn't actually get their meal period as they should have. The liability for this, um, as most people know, is the one hour meal period penalty or premium as they call it. So if you fail to provide an employee a meal period or their breaks, it can be both, uh, you need to pay them an extra hour of pay and that is calculated at the regular rate of pay which we'll talk about a little bit, is not the same as their hourly rate. So you could actually get tagged for two premium payments per day, one for missed meals and another one for missed rest periods if people claim that they don't have, um, they weren't able to take either of those. So let's talk about regular rate miscalculations. Um, this is going to make everybody's head explode, but I'm going to do my best to walk you through it. So as I just mentioned, a lot of people think, oh, I just have to pay that premium at the regular hourly rate. Well, the regular rate of pay is actually defined, if, if you Google it, you'll pull up the DLSE website where it tells you under the FLSA, it's the regular rate is calculated by taking like all remuneration, I can never say this word, remuneration or compensation earned during the week and dividing by all hours work. That is the federal standard for that. So you have to pay the regular rate of pay when they work overtime, when they have paid sick leave and these meal period penalties. And there's probably some others, but those are the three we see the most common. So when somebody says like, what do you pay for overtime? Most people say, oh, one and a half times their hourly rate. So if I'm paying you $10 an hour, then it's $15 an hour right? One and a half times. But that's not the right answer. The right answer is if they get any sort of, um, you know, commission, other incentive pay, bonus, um, anything on top of that, that has to be factored into the calculation as well. So let's take a look at some examples. So here is a regular rate calculation under the Fair Labor Standards Act where a person is working at $12 an hour and they also get commission. So they worked 44 hours, so 40 regular hours and four overtime hours. But they also received $150 that week in the form of commission. So the way you would calculate the regular rate is you would take the $12 an hour and multiply all of the hours worked by that, including those overtime hours. So you get $528. You add in the commission of $150 for a total of $678. And then you divide that by the 44 hours worked. And that's how you calculate the regular rate. So you take that and you say, oh, it's not really that that person got paid $12 an hour this week. They really made $15.41 per hour. Okay, so you've already paid for the four overtime hours at their base rate, so you still owe them the overtime premium. The overtime premium amount is going to be half of that regular rate, or in this example, $7.70. So therefore, the employee gets another $30.82. So you take the $12 times 44 hours, the commission, and then the premium pay for the overtime, and you add it all together. So the total gross wages for that pay period would actually be $708.82. Okay, it's confusing. That's why I try to type it out as, as straightforward as possible, um, but feel free to reach out if you have a question about how um, I came up with those numbers. Now let's take a look at a little bit of a different scenario that got complicated last year. So last year there was a court case 
um, there was a court case, Alvarado versus Dark Container Corporation. This came out, I think it was um, March of last year. And for whatever reason, the California um, court said, uh, we're not going to use the federal method that we've always used because California never really had direction on a specific way of calculating the overtime premium. So they, they just defaulted to the federal method under the FLSA. This court said, nope, you know what, under these very specific circumstances, we're going to do it differently. And those those circumstances were what's called a flat sum bonus. So I used the example in the last calculation, someone getting commission. In this case, this Alvarado versus Dark Container case, what happened was the employees were asked to work weekends and they were paid a flat sum bonus if they showed up to work on Saturday or Sunday. So it wasn't tied to the hours they worked, it wasn't tied to production, it wasn't tied to any sort of performance, it was just, you know what, you come in on Saturday, you're gonna get an extra $15. Come in on Sunday, you're gonna get extra $15 just for showing up, okay? So let's take a look at how that would work using similar, similar numbers to the last example. Suppose you have, on the federal method on the left, you have, you know, um, the employees work 12 hours, I mean, $12 an hour for 46 hours, they get a flat bonus of $46. Under the federal method of calculation, you would do the calculation just like in the prior example. You would take all monies that they earned, the $598, divide by the total hours worked at 46, take $13 an hour becomes their uh, regular rate, you take half of that to pay the premium portion of those six overtime hours, and that's how it's done. But look what happens when now California comes in and says, nope, you got to calculate it differently. This gets a little confusing, but you're going to basically do separate calculations for the overtime portion for the regular work and the and then the, I'm sorry, the premium portion for the regular work and the premium portion for the bonus payment. So you say, okay, I'm going to take $12 an hour times my 40 hours that I worked. I'm going to take $12 an hour times 1.5, right? Because that's the premium at the $6. And then I'm going to do the same exact thing for the bonus. I'm going to say, okay, I'm going to pay the bonus, but now I've got to calculate sort of the overtime connected to that bonus. So we're going to take the $46, divide it by non-overtime hours, is how they said this, times one and a half, then I get $10.35. So you come up with actually four line items here. So you're going to take the $480, include the job overtime, the bonus, and then the bonus overtime calculation. So it ends up being $7.35 more under the California calculation. Now, this case only applied to flat sum bonuses. So presumably, unless Curtis tells you differently, Presumably, you can still continue to do commission and everything else the same way it's always been done under the federal method. But if you have a flat sum bonus, again, just a flat amount you're giving to people, not tied to performance, production, you know, sales, anything like that, um, you can continue to do that. But once you give them a flat sum bonus, you have to use this California method. All right, last let's take a look at sick pay. A lot of people forget that you have a couple different ways of calculating uh, sick pay, but it has to be paid at the regular rate. You can do a 90 day look back, but if you're gonna do the regular rate calculation, then you're gonna essentially do the same thing. You're gonna take this, in this example, let's say that they had 46 total hours, but eight of those were sick pay. They worked six overtime and 32 regular hours. You would take the actual hours worked, Okay, so that would be your regular hours and your overtime hours. Multiply it by your $12, you get $456. Sick pay, you're going to pay them, you know, eight hours at $12, but that is not included in the regular rate calculation. And then let's say that they have um, some sort of production bonus, you know, tied to performance or something like that. You would throw that in as well. Okay. Um, do the same type of calculation. You're going to divide only by the hours worked because sick pay was not worked. Get Take half of that regular rate for the overtime and you're going to use that same calculation to do um, the sick pay as well. So you're going to add all of that in together and you end up with $647.32. I am sure that that has made a lot of people crazy. Um, for, hopefully it is not news 
to many of you on this call, but we run across people all the time that don't understand uh, what the regular rate calculation is, and it's actually a term defined under California law. Uh, the penalties can be substantial, and just to remind people, most wage and hour claims can go back up to four years, uh, so you want to be really careful on this. So different things, we had some of the similar penalties we talked about before, uh, $50 per employee for the initial pay period, and then $100 after that, not to exceed $4,000. If you have, um, if this is an employee that's already left your employment and you didn't pay all money due at the time of, of separation, then you could have another 30 day of wages uh, penalty on top of that because it's a day's wage for every day that goes by. If you have um, unpaid overtime, that's another amount that can be charged to you plus 25% of the amount with unlawfully withheld. You have potentially PAGA penalties as well. So pretty substantial penalties on something like this. So please, if you don't understand this, reach out to us, reach out to Marla's law firm. Um, let us help you with these type of calculations. Wanted to just wrap up by reminding everybody this year, a new law went into effect, SB 1343, that requires all employers with five or more employees to provide uh, harassment prevention training uh, to their employees, two hours to managers, one hour to employees by the end of the year. We do this for our clients all the time. We would love to do it for you if you have a need at your office. Uh, we can do it in person at your office. We're going to be scheduling some public events so you could send people to those events. Uh, we can do a live webinar just for your company or we're gonna do some for the public as well. We can just sign up sort of like this one. Uh, we will also have some recorded or canned webinars that people can watch at their own uh, pace on their own schedule. Uh, and we can also customize a webinar that you can use in your onboarding materials if that's of interest to you. We also can do that in both English and Spanish. So if you have a workforce and you know, Spanish is their primary language, it might be something you wanna consider doing. We also write those policies for employers and we do offer a confidential hotline for reporting any issues. And with that, Denise, I'm gonna turn it back over to you because I know I see the little uh, question sign lighting up on my dashboard so I know that we have some questions. Yeah, great, thanks uh, Linda and Curtis. And thanks again, Curtis, for pitching in for Marla so she can take advantage of her um, enjoying her new grandchild this morning. Um, we do, we have a lot of questions, and so I want to remind everybody, if you have questions, please post them in the Q&A area. I don't think we'll get to every question today, but if you post it in the Q&A area, we do follow up after the webinar. Um, so let's get to a couple ones. Linda, since you were just talking about calculations and sick leaves and all that, I'm going to start with you. Um, can we prorate the paid sick leave for part-time employees? No. So, unfortunately, and I, I can't explain California's, you know, the legislature's thinking on this, but no, and that's a good question because we do have that come up a lot where we go in and we go, okay, this person's only working 20 hours a week, so we just have to give them 12 hours of sick pay, right? And I say no. There was no provision made for reducing the requirement if somebody works part-time. So, you could potentially have somebody, you know, that that works some funny schedule or whatever, where they they end up almost working overtime, you can you cannot. I'm sorry, I'm going to confuse everybody if I go there. Just know you cannot. 24 hours, or I was going to say um, three days worth, whichever is greater. But you have to provide them with at least that minimum, even if they're working part time. Okay. Yeah, just to pick it back um, on what Linda said, real quick, the the actual language in the statute is the greater of three days or 24 hours. So even though you have employees working part-time schedules, you still have to provide at least 24 hours. Thank you, Curtis. Perfect time. Okay, great, thanks. Uh, quick question on meal periods. You discussed meal periods. Is that for uh, all employees or for only non-exempt employees? You have to follow that timing on the meal period you talked about. Great question. Yes, just non-exempt employees. Okay. Um, we have, uh, I'm trying to go through a couple of questions. Um, Curtis, in the beginning of the webinar, you talked about a duties test when you were discussing uh, uh, whether people fell into which categories. Can you let us know where you can find that duties test? Yes, so 
The easiest way to find it is to just go on the old interwebs and search for the different fact sheets that are issued by the Department of Labor, the Federal Department of Labor. So if you just go on to the old Google search engine and, and search uh, exempt, I'm just trying it right now to make sure this works, exempt fact sheet. they will pop up as, as one of the, the first selections. Okay. You can also find them in the wage orders as well, right? So yeah. um, in the wage order, you have to know which wage order. And again, there's a webinar on this if you go out to the channel. But um, under each wage order, just make sure you have the right one for your industry. It spells out who's going to qualify. Now, here's what I'll also say, because I saw that question pop up. It's really complicated. You know, we get called in to do that analysis for companies. I know Curtis does it as well. So if if you have any confusion about whether or not somebody is going to qualify as exempt, get a third party in there to take a look and see. Because if you're going to a hiring manager, they're going to always tell you that that person qualifies, right? But it really comes down to the amount of time spent performing exempt level duties. And in California, which is different from federal law, you have to spend more than 50% of your time performing those duties. So I get told this all the time well they supervise two people and I go really it's only three people in the department you're gonna tell me that that manager yes they have two direct reports but they're a working manager they're not spending more than 50% of their time hiring firing scheduling training evaluating those type of things that are exempt level duties so it's not just again how it looks on an org chart it's not just duties it's how what percentage of their time is spent doing those exempt level duties so it takes some analysis Okay, great. Um, let's talk a little bit about uh, terminated employees. If a terminated employee submits reimbursable expenses after his last day, should the company force him to complete a W-9? Accounting in this particular firm told HR that there was no way to pay them except as an independent contractor. For someone who I'll take this one, and, 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 and that's a no. Because yeah. re, uh, ex expense reimbursements is really a debt that the company owes to the employee. It's repaying the employee amount that the employee already expended on behalf of the company. So no, you would not have to get a, a, a W-9 from the employee or the determinated worker, and you would not issue a 1099 for that expense reimbursement. Yeah, I'm sort of surprised that's coming from accounting. And I don't off the top of my head know what the penalties are for for that section of the labor code that says you have to reimburse employees for all necessary reasonable expenses incurred in the performance of their duties, but there's probably penalties established for that. So I would be careful holding out for a W-9 or for anything else. I don't even, I'm surprised that they even went there to be honest with you, because like Curtis said, it's it's a debt. It's not, um, it's not wages. It's not anything like that. Okay. That, that code section actually doesn't have penalties, but Really? The, 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 yeah, the, 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 but the standard PAGA provisions would therefore apply. So if okay. you're not reimbursing your employees, you could be subject to a PAGA class action. Yeah, there you go. Hmm. Okay. One last question um, for us, Denise. I, I know, I'm trying to just, I'm tr looking at all the questions that came in. So, um, let me I'll, let me do one on sick leave and, and time because there's quite a few questions on sick leave. And like I said, we'll get back to you if we didn't get to your question today. What is the policy for sick leave time rolling over? So, okay, so this is the difference between accrual or front loading. And one of the reasons we highly, 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 underline highly recommend front loading. If you front load time, you don't roll it over. So for example, I get hired, say April 1st, I get, my 24 hours, a year goes by, let's say I've never you been sick, I come to March 31st, you just wipe out my balance and you give me another 24 hours on April 1st. However, if you're doing an accrual, then at least this is for, uh, we'll say the state of California, there might, again, there's different rules if you live in the city of Los Angeles or work in the city of Los Angeles or city of San Diego, things like that. But for statewide, what happens is if you accrue, you have to allow them to continue to accrue up to 48 hours. So 
imagine how crazy making this is. An employee has a wage statement, because you know you have to provide it to them, that says they have 48 hours available because you've allowed them to accrue it up to that level, but then you say, oh, but you know what, we can restrict your usage to 24 hours during the year. Try to explain that one to your employees. So again, I don't know why the state of California did it this way, <laughs> but it's a little crazy making. Even their FAQ, because there's an FAQ on that particular question, doesn't make any sense if you ask me why you allow them to crew up to 48 hours, but that's what the rule is. Even the drafters were asked why, and they were not able to give a good answer. Yeah, drafters I think they, the for bill. some reason, think thought like, oh, well, we'll just allow them to continue accruing because then if they need more time, but you're like, but then you gave us the ability to restrict their usage to 24 hours. So it honestly doesn't make any sense. And just, again, one more reason we say front load. So I see that it's 12 o'clock, Denise. Um, let me just yeah. jump in and tell people that we have scheduled our next webinar and we're going to talk about recruiting in a tight labor market because I know a lot of our clients call us and have issues trying to find really good people in this labor market when unemployment is so low. So you can register. It's already up on the website. It'll be April 11th at 11 a.m. We're going to have our recruiting director, uh, Kimberly Kenner Scott, with us. I'm going to be there and I think the grandmother will be back as well. <laughs> hopefully showing pictures <laughs> exactly all right everyone thanks so much for joining us have a great rest of the week thank you have a great day thank you